Okay, so uh, hi everyone. So hopefully you heard uh, some of the other talks in the course about processing data from individual subjects. However, in most neuroimaging studies, what we're really interested in is making inferences about a group of subjects. So in this lecture, I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the methods for group analyses in SPM, compare those methods to each other, and then finish with some generic recommendations for analyzing fMRI data. So for each subject we've tested, we can start by looking at a single voxel in the brain. On the x-axis of this graph is time, and on the y-axis is the magnitude of bold activity that we've measured with fMRI. Each of the red dots on this plot corresponds to the magnitude of bold activity for an individual scan. So here we have 50 or so scans that were collected at different times throughout the experiment. We fitted a general linear model to the data, as you might recall from the other talks. And here we're showing the model fit with the green line. These data were recorded during a visual experiment. In the experiment, there was a rest period, followed by the presentation of a visual stimulus, another rest period, another visual stimulus, and so on throughout the experiment. This design was more boring than many experiments you might think of, but it's just a straightforward example for our purposes here. So you can see from the data that this particular voxel responded to visual stimulation. When the visual stimulus was presented, the model estimates that the response is about 168, whereas during rest, the model approximates that the response is about 164. So this voxel has an effect size of approximately four. If we have a group of subjects, then we can look at exactly the same voxel in other subjects. So this is just for the third subject in this particular experiment. And we fit the GLM separately for each subject, so each subject has a different effect size. The effect size in the same voxel in this subject is a bit smaller than in the previous subject. Here it's approximately two. This reflects the difference between the visual stimulation on estimate, which is approximately 154, and the rest estimate, which is approximately 152. The study had 12 subjects in the analysis. While most studies would have more than this, um, we can just see the 12 subject here. This had an effect size of around four in this particular box we're looking at. And so we can just get the effect sizes for all of the subjects in the group. We can write down a list of the effect sizes from the whole group. And what we're looking for is to see whether the average effect size is significantly greater than zero. So the table on the left here just shows the values from the previous slides. You can see that for subject one, we have an effect size of four. For subject three, we have an effect size of two. And for subject 12, we have an effect size of four, like I showed you on the previous slides. In this experiment, we have two conditions, rest and visual stimulation. And if you remember, our effect size is essentially the difference between these two conditions. If our experiment had no effect of a particular manipulation on a voxel's bold activity, then we would find that the average effect size would be zero. So in this case, we can do, just do a one sample t-test to test whether the group effect size differs from zero. If it's greater than zero, then it means there's a significant effect in this voxel. So to calculate this, we first compute the mean of the effect sizes. This is just the average value of all the numbers in our list in the table on the left. We also need to know how much the effect size varies among subjects. So we can calculate the standard deviation of the numbers in the table. We call this the between subject variability. For our t-test, we need to normalize the between subjects variability by the number of subjects. And this is called the standard, the standard error of the mean. That's just the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of subjects. In this experiment, we had 12 subjects as shown by the table on the left. So we divide the standard deviation by the square root of 12. If you had 24 subjects, you divide by the standard devi 
a discovery of uh, 94. And to calculate whether the effect's significant, we can now calculate the t-value. The t-value is just the mean divided by the standard error. Here, this is 2.67 divided by 0 0.31. And that's equal to 8.61, which is a reasonably large t-value. That's associated with a p-value of 10 to the power of minus 6. That's below the usual significance threshold of 0 0.05. So we might conclude here that there's a significant effect of this, um, of this contrast. And the voxel here, the plotting, is sensitive to visual stimulation. However, it's also worth mentioning that if we're doing this t-test in lots of voxels, then we'd also have to prep for multiple comparisons. Essentially, what this means is that p, the p threshold for detecting a significant effect would be much lower. So this type of analysis is called a random effect analysis because we're comparing the group effect to the between subject variability. From the equation, you'll see that if the group is more variable, the standard error of the mean will be larger, and so the t value will be smaller. The same approach is also sometimes called the summary statistic approach. That's because we summarize each subject with one single value, which is their effect size for the manipulation of interest. In this case, that was visual stimulation versus rest. So overall, this type of approach is known as the summary statistic implementation of random effects analysis. A different approach you might have heard about is fixed effects analysis, which is implemented in a slightly different way. It's important to note that we don't recommend this approach for neuroimaging data. Nevertheless, it's good to be aware of the differences between random and fixed effects analyses. So again, with this approach, we're also interested in effect sizes, but for a fixed effects analysis, we're also interested in the variability of the effect within subjects. This is essentially asking, how, mod how well does the model fit the data? And in reality, there are lots of factors that can affect how well the model fits the data. Some examples of these might be scanner noise, how long you scan for, and how many scans you have per condition. And we summarize this variability with a single statistic. This is the root mean square error. To calculate th this, we first take the difference in bold activity between each of the individual scans and the model fit. So in this case, it'll be between each of the red dots here and the green line. We then square those values so they're all positive and take the mean across all of the scans. We then take the square root to inverse the square operation that we applied at the beginning. And that gives us a measure of the within subjects variability. For this voxel in this participant, that value happens to be 0 0.9. For subject three, the model's not quite fitting so well at some parts of the time series. For example, at times between 50 and 60 seconds, some of these red dots are much further away from the green line. And so the root mean square values will be larger. You can see that when the within subjects variability value is calculated for this subject, we get a higher value of 1.5. Again, we simply repeat this for all subjects. In subject 12, you can see the model's fitting reasonably well here, and the within subjects variability is 1.1. And perhaps a few data points at the end that aren't fitting quite so well in this particular case. And importantly, for fixed effects analysis, we essentially just treat all of the scans from all of the subjects in the same way. Essentially, what this means we're doing is we're just concatenating results from all of the subjects into a longer time series. This means that instead of having 50 scans from subject one, 50 from subject two, and so on, we've now just got a pool of 600 scans, corresponding to 50 for each of the 12 subjects. And we use all of those 600 scans to calculate the average effect in the group. In this case, the group effect is the same as we had before, because we had the same number of scans per participant, so we get the same value of 2.67. However, our estimate of the variability is different from the random effects analysis. 
And that's because for the fixed effects analysis, we take a different measure of variability. We take the variability as the average of the within subject variabilities. So I've listed the within subject variabilities in the table on the left here. You can see that some subjects have very low variances, like subject five, whose variance is 0 0.4, whereas other subjects have larger variances, such as subject eight, whose variance is 2.1. And the idea is that for a fixed effects analysis, we just take the average of these values. We calculate the standard error by dividing the, the, um, by the square root of the number of data points that we use to calculate the mean. So the same as before. However, now our number of data points is actually the number of scans for all subjects. And that's because we concatenated together all of the scans from all of the subjects to calculate the mean. So we essentially used 600 um, scans to work out the group effect. This means that we're now dividing by the square root of 600, which you'll realize is a much bigger number than the square root of 12 that we divided for by for our random effects analysis. And this means that in most cases, the estimate of the standard error in a fixed effects analysis is much smaller than in a random effects analysis. Therefore, when we calculate our t-value, we divide by a smaller number, and our t-value ends up being much larger. Here you can see we end up with a huge t-value of 62.7. This gives us a really small p-value of 10 to the power of minus 51. This could be potentially dangerous because it means we'll generally conclude that more voxels are significant under a fixed effects analysis. And this is generally thought of as being spuriously overconfident. This is because, in theory, we could have a really tiny effect size, in this case, a really small effect of visual stimulation, which is nevertheless significant. And that's one of the reasons it's not recommended in neuroimaging. In neuroimaging, typically for each subject, you have a few hundred scans. So it adds up to a lot of data points across the group. This means that we'd be dividing by a very large number and potentially overinflating our p-value. So in a fixed effects analysis, what we're doing is we're comparing the group effect to the within subject variability. We're not taking into account the between subjects variability. Therefore, we can't make an inference about the population from which the subjects were drawn. Instead, what we're doing is we're making an inference about this specific sample of subjects. This often leads to inflated inference about um, when compared to a random effects analysis. So in neuroimaging, we generally don't recommend this method. In a random effects analysis, we do consider the between subjects variability. So if you were to look at a new subject, then you'd be relatively confident that they get a similar effect size. And for this reason, random effects analyses are the most common approach in neuroimaging analyses. There's also a third type of analysis called mixed effects analysis, which you may have heard of if you've analyzed other types of data in the past. So for example, especially if you're doing language research. In mixed effects analyses, some of the variables could be fixed effects and others may be random effects. So we're essentially modeling both types of effects. In neuroimaging, you treat the effect size of the experimental effects as random effects. A mixed effects analysis also allows you to include fixed effects in the analysis. So for example, you might want to include the size of the drifts that you've heard about in the other lectures. And this would give you a mixed effects approach. If you want to do a mixed effects analysis in SPM, you can, you can use the function SPM underscore MFX. Okay, so everything we've talked about so far is just for one voxel in the brain. And in the analyses I've talked you through so far, we looked at the same voxel in every subject, and we just did an inference on that one voxel. Of course, in most neuroimaging analyses, we're usually interested in more than one voxel. And so we don't only have a single time series like the ones I've been showing you, but instead we have a time series for every voxel. And so in this type of analysis, if we want to look at all of the voxels in our particular image, we can just do the same procedure, voxel by voxel across the whole image. It's as simple as that. 
So this gives us an effect size for every voxel. Here I've just filled in some of the values here. You could imagine having a value for every voxel across the entire brain. So to summarize this approach, what we do is that we take our data for every voxel. We then fit a GLM of every voxel in the brain and we end up with one contrast image per subject. Because we've entered lots of voxels here, the image takes into account the effect size for every voxel in the analysis. If you've designed your experiment to test for three or four different effects, you compute a contrast image separately for each of those effects for every subject. This is what we call our first level analysis because it happens for every subject. So then we do a second level analysis at the group level. The contrast images, which essentially contain the effect size for each voxel, for each subject, become the data for our second level analysis. So here the rows of this matrix just reflect every contrast image that's been entered into the, the design. And so we can just do a one sample t-test here for every voxel in the brain. And this just compares the effect size in the group to zero. What we end up with as an output from the analysis is a statistical parametric map. And this shows the t-values for each voxel projected onto a brain. Here the t-values have been thresholded, so the voxels in white are effects that are significantly greater than zero, or which survived our thresholded t-value. At this stage, we can implement a correction for multiple comparisons when we've produced this T-map. So in this experiment, you'll remember that we had a visual paradigm, so it's perhaps not too surprising that we see significant voxels in the cicadal cortex. And we consider these to be significant across the group. That means that if we were to scan another subject for the same population, we could be confident that we would get similar activation. So that's how to do a random effects analysis with the summary statistic approach. Again, we had one summary statistic per subject per voxel, which we fed into the second level analysis. However, it turns out this is summary statistics approach isn't quite an exact method. And the gold standard is implemented using hierarchical models. With a hierarchical model, you take into account both between subject and within subject variances, and that guarantees the best results. You'll notice that in the summary statistic approach I just showed you, we just took into account the between subject variances. The first level in our hierarchical model is just the GLM we've talked about already. The first level parameters are dependent on the design matrix at the second level above, and those are dependent on the level above that, and so on until you get to the top level. Each level, we have multiple variance components, and given the data, we want to estimate the effect sizes at each level and also the variance components. This allows us to then make inferences about effects that occur at any level in the hierarchy. So this hierarchical modeling approach I'm showing you here is very general and is actually used for a variety of different things in SPM and brain imaging not only for group level effects in fMRI analyses. So for example, we can use the same type of hierarchical approach to do EEG source reconstruction. You can find out more about hierarchical models by reading this paper here. For group analyses of fMRI data, we commonly use a two level model where we model the within subject variance at the first level and the between subject variance at the second level. So here's a schematic of the first level. What we're saying is that our time series at particularly a voxel in the brain is explained by a first level design matrix on the left here. The first level parameters and also some first level errors. Here the data Y are the time series from all subjects. And notice that this is different to our summary statistic approach where we entered each subject separately. 
In our design matrix here, the left column of the design matrix X would contain all of the factors that we think explain the data for the first subject. The middle subject, or sorry, the middle column for the second subject, and so on. So in the design I showed you before, we would have 12 of these. Then the regression coefficients correspond to the effect sizes for those subjects. The variances of the errors would be the within subject variances for each subject. And the effect sizes for each subject are actually constrained in this model to vary about around the group effect size at the second level, theta 2. This is specified using a between subject variance parameter. So there's an algorithm called restricted maximum likelihood, which allows you to estimate the within subject and the between subject variances and the within subject and between subject effects in an iterative fashion. That's implemented in SPM in the function SPM underscore REML. Essentially what this algorithm does is it takes an initial estimate of the parameters and then it goes back and forth between the levels until the parameters provide a good fit for the neuroimaging data. We're constantly going back and forth between these two levels. So here are some results from an auditory experiment using these two methods. Hopefully you can see that the results from the summary statistic approach and the hierarchical model are very similar. So even though the hierarchical model is the gold standard approach, we don't actually use it very often because it's computationally slow. What we're doing in the hierarchical model is we're putting all of the data from all of the subjects into the model at the same time. And it's an iterative procedure where you start off with initial estimates and update them back and forth at the different levels based on the data. So this can take a really long time to estimate. Whereas when we do the summary statistic approach, we've actually separated out the first level and the second level estimates. And there's no iteration, so it actually operates much more quickly. So given that in most cases, we usually get the same results, and because the summary statistic approach is much quicker and more efficient, most people will tend to use the summary approach in brain imaging. We can actually show that the summary statistic approach will give identical results to the hierarchical model if two conditions are met. First, the within subject variances need to be identical across subjects. And second, the first level design matrices need to be the same across subjects as well. And this includes the number of trials. Now, if we only have very small deviations from these assumptions, then the summary statistics approach is still a very good approximate. For example, it's unlikely in a real experiment that the within subjects variance will be identical across subjects. But as long as you don't have any extreme outliers, the approach still tends to work very well. In a similar way, if you have roughly the same number of trials per participant within, let's say, an order of magnitude of about 10, then you won't get much better results using a hierarchical approach. So there's a demonstration of this by Mumford and Nichols showing that the summary statistic approach is robust in many practical situations. I'd recommend that you have a read of this paper if you'd like to find out a little bit more about this. Now, the most common reason that the summary statistic approach may not be suitable is if you have vastly different numbers of trials in different subjects. So for example, you might be looking at activity related to seizures in epileptic patients in this case, the number of seizures they might have might be vastly different across participants. And so in this case, you have quite a difference in the number of trials for each condition, and a hierarchical model will give better results. You might be able to think of other examples from your own research where you have different numbers of trials, but this tends to be quite rare. So, all of the examples I've shown you so far have just been comparing two conditions in a within subjects design. So what we've done is we've done the contrast between the conditions at the first level to work out the effect sizes for each subject. And then at the second level, we've done a one sample t-test to work out whether the effect is bigger than zero in the group. Obviously, the example we started with at the beginning with visual stimulation or rest is a very simplistic example of an experimental design. 
There are quite a lot of other designs that do have simple effects like this. So for example, you might be contrasting sound versus silence. You might be contrasting two different experimental conditions that are manipulated within subjects. But what if you have a slightly more sophisticated design? For example, three conditions or two different subject groups even. So first we'll talk about what to do if you have three conditions in the within subject design. Like the examples we've considered so far, in this within subject design, every participant takes part in every condition. And you can see this illustrated in the table here. We have the same subjects in all three conditions. So some examples of this could be perhaps a visual experiment comparing different types of visual stimuli. For example, comparing a condition with faces, a condition with houses, and a condition with tools. Or perhaps it could be three different memory tasks. For example, a one-back test, a two-back test, and a three-back working memory task. And so if your question of interest is whether there's a main effect of the manipulation, so this would correspond to a difference among the visual stimuli or a difference among the different working memory loads. In that case, we can use a one-way within subjects ANOVA. And generally within subject designs are really powerful because you've controlled for lots of different things that can vary between subjects. If you instead wanted to look for effects of differences between particular pairs of conditions in this type of designs, design, you could just use the same approach as we've already talked about. That would be calculating multiple contrast images at the first level and then conducting several one sample t-tests at the second level. So an example of this approach would be you might have a contrast at the first level between condition one and condition two, another condition between condition two and condition three, another contrast between conditions one and three, and perhaps one contrast comparing condition one to the average of conditions two and three. You could then take all four of those contrast images up to the group level and do separate group level inferences using one sample t-test, essentially comparing each contrast's effect to zero. Let's consider a different scenario now where instead of having a within subjects design, we have a between subjects design. And so what that means is that we have different subjects assigned to different experimental conditions. For example, if you want to test the effects of a drug, then you might not be able to get all of the subjects to take all of the drugs, or you might be even worried that perhaps there'll be interaction between the drugs. So you might want to make sure that one group takes a placebo, another group takes drug one, and another drug group takes drug two. So in this case, we'd do the same analysis at the first level for each subject. Then we'd want to use a one way between subjects ANOVA at the second level. If we were comparing two conditions, so pairs of these conditions, for example, placebo versus drug one and placebo versus drug two, then we'd instead use a two sample t-test. And this takes account of the between subjects variability. Another example of this, you might be comparing different patient groups, which obviously then the same subjects can't be in the same conditions. So you might be having a healthy group, potentially, one group with Alzheimer's disease and one group with frontotemporal dementia, for example. So to summarize, group analysis usually proceeds with random effects analyses rather than fixed effects analysis. That's because we want to compare the effect size to between subject variability, and therefore that allows us to generalize to the population that the subjects are drawn for. With a fixed effects approach, we can only make an inference about the specific group of subjects that we tested in the experiment. The gold standard approach in neuroimaging analyses is to use a hierarchical model. If we, as we've seen, that's computationally intensive because it uses an iterative process between first and second levels in the hierarchical model. In fact, for most applications in neuroimaging, we actually get pretty similar results using a summary statistics approach which is much more efficient. And the summary statistics approach has been shown to be robust when the number of trials is approximately equal across subjects, and also when the within subject variances are approximately equal as well. We've also talked about 
several different types of experimental designs. We've seen that if we want to contrast two conditions within subjects, you can use a one sample t-test at the second level. If you have more than two conditions in the within subjects design, you can use a one way within subjects ANOVA. If however, you have different groups which participate in different experimental conditions, then you might want to use a between subjects ANOVA to test for a difference among groups or a two sample t-test if you want to compare specific pairs of conditions. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the course.